some good things. All right, here's my top 10 tips, and you're, you're going to hear a lot of similar themes in what you've heard from Nigel and Peter, and, um, and let me tell you, some of what Peter said in particular really resonated um, in terms of what it's like at the, at the real coalface. Number one, it's all about the people. And this one will always be number one for me. Um, you, you would often hear um, investors say that ultimately they really invest in the people, not necessarily the technology. Um, I don't think that's quite true, but I do, I've certainly seen plenty of examples where if it's technology that's got some possibilities, but a fabulous team, an investor will back that fabulous team and work with them on the technology. I don't often see it the other way. So you might have fabulous technology, but not the right kind of people around it, unless that investor has kind of absolutely got in his or her pocket the right person to plug into that opportunity right there, and that the inventors or the original founders are receptive to having someone come in and help them, you won't often get the investor past, um, past that hurdle. So it's very much about the people. And I just want to reinforce what Peter said. My view is, once you've got your money and you've got your CEO and CTO, who tend to be the first two uh, folks in a company, the very next person you should hire is an absolutely crack salesman. Um, I really do believe that that is the case. And I've seen plenty of opportunities where the salesperson has been higher, number six or seven, and by then it's kind of all over. Um, know your competitive advantage. So kind of, you need to know what sets you apart from everybody else in your field. You should never assume that you're alone in your area. There is always someone emerging or there already, and you need to really be able to um, understand in your own mind what your advantage is, what your differentiating um, uh, features are, and you need to be able to explain that clearly. You need to keep an eye on your competitors too, by the way. Um, I've seen too many cases where um, there was one startup company that came out of CSIRO, one of the two that um, no longer exists, sadly, um, and they were their biggest competitor was literally just down the road in Brisbane, and they just kept, you know, they kept just ignoring them, kind of hoping they would go away. Anyway, they didn't. And ultimately, um, they went on to big things, and, and the CSIRO startup um, sadly went under. I mean, it was acquired, so the technology is still around, but it was pretty disappointing for the founders. Commercialisation of the team sport, um, not a and a marathon, and not a sprint. So it takes time. Um, Nigel and I, I think we're talking out here, and these things take 20 or 30 years, depending on the on the kind of technology and what's behind it, particularly uh, biotech, that takes years and millions and millions and millions of dollars. So you've got to be in it for the long haul. Um, and you need to build really good teams around you. Access advisors, get hold of all the free advice that's around. Um, get hold of, your, of, of a commercialisation at um, Australia case manager or mentor. Um, you know, surround yourself with those people because you need a good team around you. Be realistic about value. Peter's already very eloquently talked about that. The amount of times I've had those conversations, what, you know, what, <laughs> you, 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 you want more than 10% for a million dollars? You know, it's, it's just extraordinary. So um, CSIRO has started up companies that are now worth many, many millions on a couple of hundred grand. And for a couple of hundred grand, you know, they've got 40 or 50% of the company at the beginning. You know what? That's a good outcome. And two of those cases, one of those actually is a company that was formed down here in um, Canberra. Um, and one of them, ultimately, CSIRO's, you know, share, we managed to exit for $35 million. You know, and that's because we were open-minded and took a small amount of money at the beginning and were re realistic about the value at that early stage. Um, great commercialisation outcomes start with great focused science. So that's probably a bit of a CSIRO-centric thing. So that's just reinforcing CSIRO admission to make sure that as we embark on a research project that we've really got a good line of sight in terms of 
what, um, what market failure it's addressing or what the opportunity actually is at the end of it. And we do that by partnering with industry, by partnering with other collaborators and constantly re-evaluating are we still focusing on the end outcomes in our research project. Um, strong unencumbered IP improves your options for commercialisation. IP is important. It's not the be all and end all, but it is important. It's very important in a product um, play, which is um, I think the point that Peter was making. Um, you need to have a really strong IP there. The unencumbered piece is something to always look out for. Happens all the time in my organisation. Um, we were getting very close to commercialising an opportunity out of our ICT group recently. Um, and this one's highly prospective and we, we, we've got lined up a international investor to invest um, close to $12 million into it and take it out as a startup. And we've got the scientists excited about it. It's terrific. I was literally ready to kind of ink the deal and um, one of our patent managers walked by and said, Jan, I think we've got a problem. And I said, well, what's that? And what it was is that um, four or five years ago, the science team, as we often do, brought in a PhD student from one of their local universities. And the scientist, I guess without thinking all the way through to the end outcome, agreed in the student agreement to share 50% of all future commercialisation revenues with the university. Not with the student, but only with the university. Not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I think if the, if the student and the university was bringing in valuable background IP and was going to be there you know, from the beginning to the end, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's important that we do share returns appropriately in terms of the contributors. But this was for a $50,000 uh, six-week PhD project. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> watch out for your IP. Your IP advisor is your best friend, all right? <laughs> um, whatever C, oh, sorry, whatever C capital, you, <coughs> capital you think you need, double it. That's an obvious one. In fact, many people say triple it, quadruple it, etc. The sad fact of the matter, you heard my story before about us starting one up with just $200,000. I know how it works, you'll get what you can and you'll go anyway, <coughs> but I guess I'm just saying, open your eyes, know that you're never going to get enough seed capital at the beginning, and think about that before you um, get cracking. Um, and this is where your mums and your dads and your brothers and your sisters and uncles and aunties all come into play, because pretty soon you're going to run out and you're going to need to go to those friendly folks to, um, to get it. Smart money is the best, we've heard that it's a similar theme. Um, Nigel talked about the CA money being smart. You bet it is. It's because it comes with advisors with it, good experienced advisors like Nigel and his colleagues. Um, Peter talked about the crowdsourcing. So can you imagine, there's nothing worse actually for an entrepreneur to suddenly have these lots and lots of money and not have anyone around to kind of help them at that scary early stage. So smart money is the best. Um, I've actually, myself at CSIRO, we've, we've turned down significant sums of money because we've looked at the, um, you know, the folks that are coming with the money and we've kind of decided, you know what, they're, they're not bringing the right skills that we need for that. And we've gone with lesser money elsewhere simply because the skills were better suited mm -hmm. to what that science team needed. Have a business plan. You do actually need to have a business plan. Um, God, for God's sake, don't make it a big one. But you do need to have a business plan. You need to know what your goals are, where you're heading, how you're going to get there, how you're going to hire the right people. You do need to have a business plan. But don't get too attached to it, because in my experience, they get tossed out and replaced pretty quickly in those early days. But start with something, is my advice. Um, there was one company, in fact, the company that we started out uh, down here in um, Canberra, um, in the first year, in the first 14 months, they had four different business plans. We just kept evolving it, and thank goodness we did, because ultimately we got, you know, we went, we were poles different from what we initially thought the business opportunity was. Um, and the last one, I think this is a little bit of a um, an issue for Australia, I think, um, and you probably picked up. I'm originally from New Zealand. It applies there too. Um, Australians don't celebrate failure as much as others do. So you go to 
you know, the Silicon Valley or, or, or Boston around the biotech area in, in North America in particular. And the folks that have started and failed and started and failed, they are celebrated. And people will back them. So, I mean, I really, you know, don't fear it. You should assume that you're going to start up several things before, you know, something finally hits you and really celebrate that failure part. Um, the company I mentioned earlier, the one up in Brisbane that was in, it was selling a, um, a minerals analysis, um, very high-end um, uh, product and system, and it, and it went under. It took about six years. It was a long, slow, very sad death, but it went under. Um, one of the most, one of the strongest engagements I ever got at CSIRO was when I fronted up to the CSI board because I was a, a non-executive director on that company from the beginning to the end. I spun them out at CSI and I was, I was there to the bitter end. And I fronted up to this full CSIRO board, um, made at that time or headed up by um, Catherine Livingston, some incredibly smart business people. And I pretty much did a presentation telling them where it all went wrong and where I personally went wrong. So the lessons that I learned from it, the things I would do differently, you know, with the next um, spin, up, the spin out, etc. And I got the best response I, I think I've ever had in my career at that high level. They were engaged and they said, you know what, Jan, this is great. You know, lots of people kind of, you know, to form a puddle in a corner when they've had a failure and sort of hope that no one asks them, you know, what the hell went wrong. In that case, you know, I was upfront about it. And, and certainly since then, I've shared that story quite a few times and we have certainly inside CSI learned from it. So that was all I wanted to cover today. I hope that's um, I hope that's useful. And um, and you, you, as I said, you picked up I think some common themes between Nigel, Peter, and I from that. Thank you very much to the organisations for asking me.